people of God, we are welcome to this service. This service on air is being conducted by St. Paul Anglican Church, and the entire church will be at the degree workers. May the good Lord bless you as you listen at home in Jesus' name. Amen. Church of Nigeria in uh, 785. I want to welcome everyone of us this morning to this Bible study. We pray as we listen to the Word of God and interact in the Word of God. The Lord will bless us mightily in the mighty name of Jesus as we bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity given to us to gather your presence. As we want to discuss your Word this morning, we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit and we ask for your wisdom knowledge and understanding of your word this morning. These are many more we ask through the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the third Sunday after Trinity, study 26. We want to continue in our study, our team, in the name of Jesus Christ. Our sub-team 
his attributes of Jesus Christ. And the topic we'll be considering this morning is omnipresence. Our test is taken from Psalm 139, from verse 1 to 16. I read, O Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my paths and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is I, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from the Spirit? Or whither shall I flee from the presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall the hand lead me, and the right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right way. My substance will not hide from thee, when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the heart. Thy eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. The hymn of our study this morning is divided into three. Number one, to understand the scope and the nature of God's active presence. Number two, to understand the divine attributes of omnipresence in Jesus' internal state. And number three, is to how to obtain or lose the relational presence of God. Introduction. Omnipresence is a theological term that refers to the unlimited nature of God or his ability to be everywhere at all times. The active presence of God, both in places and in relationships. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. is one of the sheep of this presupposition running through the scripture. The triune God is present everywhere, and there is no place without God and no place before Him. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18. Jesus laid aside His omnipresence during His time on earth, but that did not limit Him in meeting some challenging situations in the lives of His disciples. John chapter 11, verse 21, and verse 38 to 44. He has taken up that again divine attribute of omnipresence now in his internal state. In summary, what they are trying to tell us this morning is that Christ is everywhere. He is everywhere, all over the world, and there is nothing hidden from his side. I pray as we continue in this study, the good Lord will bless us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us go to the study guide and question. Question number one. From Psalm 139, verse 7 to 13, present three different ways you can prove the omnipresence of God. In, uh, in the psalm on that study, when we look at question 7, the psalmist asks that where was the place that he would go away from God's spirit? And when we look at um, verses 8 to 10, he described uh, that there was no place on earth, where he could run to, to the ends of the earth, where God's presence or his eyes will not reach him. So that is the first broad category in which he used to describe how he could uh, run away from God. The second category talks about the elements, talks about light or darkness. Uh, verses uh, 11 to 12 summarizes for us that we cannot even hide 
from God with elements. In, in the light, he's there. In the darkness, he's there. In other words, God is not like a GSM that has areas of coverage. You cannot go inside and you can't see when it is raining. God won't find you there. Or that when it is in the middle of the night, that is when uh, the evil spirits are out, God can't find you. God, both darkness and light, is the same before God. Now, the third category talks about our inmost thoughts. It talks about being formed and fashioned in our inmost being by God. It means that even our very thoughts do not escape the presence and the searchlight of God. To cap it all up, God's coverage area, the whole universe. Like Second Chronicles says, there is no place that we can build that can contain God because even the heavens can't contain Him. God is indeed omnipresent and as such, we should treat Him. Question 2. How do people define the limits of God's presence? Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 10, and Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23 to 27. According to some of the parts read in the introduction, the triumph God is present everywhere, and there is no place without God and no place beyond Him. We can see that human beings are myopic in thought, and that's why we limit the presence of God everywhere. And this can be seen in chapter 4 where Cain and Abel had issues. And Cain forgot that God is everywhere because of his myopic thinking. He didn't know that God was seeing him in all the art he was committing. And also when we look at uh, Jeremiah 20, uh, uh, 23. We can see also the prophets. The prophets then ought to teach the people what the people need to do, what they need to know. They were just doing what they felt is, uh, they are taught they were doing what uh, they know. Knowing they forgot that God knows their thought and knows what was happening. And we can see in verse 23. God made them to know and realize that am I not God? Eh? And he told them, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Says the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth? Says the Lord. So, in nutshell, we need to know that our actions and inaction, God knows everything. In our homes, you see children pilfering, stealing, thinking that their parents don't know. And God is seeing them. You see human beings committing adultery, doing evil, fornicating, and they forgot that God is seeing them. So, God, that is the thought of human beings. Our mouthy thinking makes us to believe that God is not seeing us. And God is seeing us everywhere. And all our actions is seen to him. Thank you. Bless you, sir. Now, since we now know that God's presence is not limited, this will lead us to our third question, which says, how can you explain the omnipresence of Jesus Christ to an unbeliever? How can you explain the omnipresence of Jesus Christ to an unbeliever? John chapter 5, verse 17 Verse 30, John chapter 8, verse 28, and Hebrew chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3. If you look at John 5, 17, Jesus Christ affirmed that my father is working and myself I am working. That is, Jesus Christ and God the Father, they are one. If you look at one of the phrases and the um, Sentences where we, we always read every Sunday in our Nicene Creed. He said that our Lord Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. That's, that's no separation at all. There's no division at all between God the Father 
and God the Son. They are one and they will never be divided. So the work that God is doing is also what Jesus Christ is doing. And even now, and that is why it's very easy for him to affirm in John chapter 5 verse 17 that God the Father, who is my Father, is working and the Son is also working. How did Jesus promise his omnipresence to all believers in his name? Matthew 28 verse 20 and John 14 verse 18 to 20. And secondly, and how is this manifesting in the believer's life? This question is three in one question. So anybody that's going to answer the question, we're going to answer two questions. The first one is, how did Jesus, how did Jesus promise his omnipresence? To all believers in his name. Secondly, how is this manifesting in the lives of the believers? The gospel, according to St. John, the gospel of Jesus Christ, chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. You can see the promise of God, of Jesus about his uh, omnipresence to all believers in his name. From that verse, let me read from John 14, verse 26. For the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus was telling us or was telling the believers, those who believe in his name, from these uh, verses, John 14, verse 26, that he will send a comforter to those who believe in him. And by sending his comforter to the believers in his name, his omnipresence will be re revealed. Then coming to the second part that says, how is this manifesting in the believer's life? You can see that uh, the power of Jesus manifests through Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers. And then the power of Holy Spirit, it is the power of Holy Spirit that helped the disciples and all believers to do miracles and to do the works of God successfully. Thank you very much, sir. We will see how the promise of his presence was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, from verse 1 to 5, in the book of Matthew, we see Jesus promising his disciples that when he goes low, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And we see the fulfillment in Acts. And after the fulfillment of the Holy, coming of the Holy Spirit, we could see a lot of things that happen within the church, expansion of the church. Even I, I was somewhere in the, in the Acts of the Apostle, I read that even the shadow of Peter's was healing the people. That shadow is not just ordinary shadow, that is the presence, the only presence of God. And that's one of the ways God manifested his omnipresence in the life of the believers. In conclusion, God is neither limited to nor dependent upon any place or anyone as his universal presence encompasses all creation. Jesus reveals what God's presence is like and his passion that was and is to have a relationship with everyone who will he allow him to manifest his presence to him or her? Food for thought. Christ's omnipresence is vitally experienced by only genuine believer. I want to listen to this again. Food for thought. Christ's omnipresence is vitally experienced by only genuine believer. That means if you are not a genuine believer, there is no way you can experience the presence of of God or the omnipresence of Christ. I pray we we'll all experience his presence in the mighty name of Jesus. 
I remember verse is taken from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew chapter 28 verse 20. And I would like us to repeat after me. Matthew 28 verse 30, 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you once again for the study this morning. We pray that your presence will not depart away from us in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray your presence will not depart away from your church in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray wherever we go, wherever we find ourselves as believers. We pray your omni presence will be with us. Thank you, Father, because you're a mighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Let us rise. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God and the whole company of heaven to offer unto our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray for others as well as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruit of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence in our midst. Let us kneel. Let us confess our sins before the Lord by saying after me. O oh God, our Father, we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, we beseech thee. Cleanse us from all our sins. And help, and help us to overcome our faults through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and through faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 15. We shall read in alternate order. Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy air? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness, as he is in his heart. 
he that backwards not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Shall together read, He that put not out his money to lustre, nor taken reward against his innocence, he that dwells these things shall never be moved. service is taken from the epistle of Paul to Titus, chapter 3, reading commences from verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also, we are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of generation regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost, which he shared on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. This is the word of God.
Jesus pray. Lord, we appreciate you for the privilege that you have given to us to listen to your word. Lord, we pray that you will minister to our spirits in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that at the end of this day, we will have reasons to glorify you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. The theme for our meditation is parental responsibility moral training. And our text will be taken from Proverbs chapter 22. We'll read verse 6, verse 8a, and verse 15. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, 8a, and verse 15. I read, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. When we talk about parental responsibility, we are actually talking about duties that parents must do. When a child is born, from what Proverbs chapter 22 verse 15 tells us, you cannot leave the child to himself. Foolishness is bound in the, in the heart of the child. So, parents have duties, responsibilities, something that they must be involved in doing. From that first day of birth up till the child, the time that the child eventually leaves their home to go and start his or her own home. What are these responsibilities? We are going to just be looking at the moral aspect. What are morals? Morals are the good things, good behavior, good attitude, good things that a child must know must do. So, moral training is not something that is plucked from somewhere. It is something that is inculcated from parents into their children. From the passage we read, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, it tells us that moral training is extremely very, very important. It's not something that should be neglected. Neglecting moral training is to jeopardize the future bliss of both the child and the future blessings and benefits of the parents. When we neglect moral training, we jeopardize the future bliss, happiness of that child and then the future blessing because it is the training you give your child that will determine the blessing that you are going to receive. I read a passage in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 9. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 9. Most the, 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 and Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, was talking to Moses' mother, take this child away and nurse it for me and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nurse it. So, when you nurse a child, or the way you nurse a child, determine the wages, the benefits that you receive, ultimately. That's very, very instructive. That's very, very important for every parent to note. It is compulsory for Christian parents to invest their lives in showing moral principles in the life of their children. It's very, very important for Christian parents to invest in the life of their parents. Verse 8a of Proverbs chapter 22 that we read before, I read again. He that soweth iniquities shall reap vanity, implying that it is what you sow, that is what you are going to reap. If you sow to the wind, you will reap vanity. But if you sow to the spirit, 
you will reap eternal life. I pray that you will reap eternal life. But it behooves you to do the right thing so that you will reap good fruit. Bringing up our children morally is not an easy task. It's never an easy task. Nobody wakes up a day and puts corn inside the ground and then expects to get the fruits tomorrow. No. It takes a lot of nurturing. And that's why Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 tells us, we should train up a child in the way that he should go. I want to say quickly here that training is meant for children. Yes, we can train adults, but God in his wisdom tells us that it is easier to train children than to mend an adult. I pray that the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 19, the scripture tells us concerning training. He said, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So, when we lay a good foundation in training our children, when we get to the future, we find the eternal life then. I pray that you will find the eternal life in the life of your children in Jesus' name. Amen. To raise children that will be useful to God, training helps us to raise children that will be useful to God. Both parents must be involved in that training. It's not something that one parent is going to do at the expense of the other parent. No. Both the father and the mother must be involved in raising up children that will be useful to God and that will bring glory to their own names tomorrow. Raising children is a great task. It is not something that can be left to a third party. I see a lot of parents who leave their children to mates, aunts, uncles, and so on and so forth. That's a very risky, risky thing, especially in these days when no one or very few people can be trusted. You cannot delegate it. So, it's very, very important. We don't train adults. I've said that before. So there are areas of moral training that parents must inculcate into the life of their children. Number one is we must train our children to greet. We must train our children to respect elderly ones. And not only elderly ones, we must also train them to respect everybody. We must also train our children to be honest. We must equally train our children discipline must inculcate discipline into our children. Other aspects of training is hard work. We must train our children to work hard. We must train our children to, to do house chores. We must train our children to show appreciation. We must train our children to show contentment. One of the major challenges we have in the world is that people are greedy. But the Bible tells us that contentment is great gain. We must train our children to have unity among siblings. It's only in the home that such things. You can't, train, you can't do that in school. That's not part of the school curriculum. It must, it must be embedded in the home curriculum. Then we must also train our children to have endurance. To endure. The Bible says we should endure hardness. As a soldier of Christ. We must also train our children to honor their parents and treat opposite sex rightly. It is only when you train your children to train the to teach to handle the opposite sex correctly, that's when they will marry and not bash their wives or even take knives to kill their husbands. We must, we must also train our children to have good dress sense. 
I, I listened to somebody and he said, a lot, of two, a lot of us spend so many hours before the mirror, and yet we still come out naked. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And then we must also train them to have to do domestic duties. Domestic duties. Finally, I want to say that Christian parents must rise up to the responsibility of training their children if we are not going to neglect, if we are not going to become guilty before the Lord tomorrow. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let's bow down our head as we pray. Eternal Father, we want to appreciate you. We glorify your name. We ask, O oh Lord, that grace to do what you have given us ability to do, you will release upon us in the name of Jesus. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.
The Right Reverend Dr. Emmanuel Uda is a decule, a Tipuba, Gisha Loro, a Corny, a Luduru, a Tiawan Yaworan, Papa Gilati, Joseph Post, Anglican Church, Shodubi, a Tipuba, Joe, Toa, Shodubi, the King, the Lakwako, a Badra, Fue, Correa, Boko, Loro, Lori, Chen, a Darafon, you, a me, only a Paris, only Latin, Rory Mimo. Five hundred and ninety one. 